Hello, Dr. Jimmy here. Just would like to apologize for, for the previous video that I put up concerning Halloween Horror Night 6, uh, Journey into Fear. <clears throat> fear, fear. Uh, it, uh, it, it was a bit odd, I think, a bit aberrant. I don't know what came over me. Something, something just seemed to hmm, come over me, and I, uh, if, it, if it caused any disturbance, I apologize for it now. And please want to reassure everyone, I am completely sane. I am not in league with the forces of darkness and evil. <sighs> No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm a perfectly normal, decent human being. And, and this is this is uh, no. Put away the pointed sticks and the and the torches and the crucifixes and garlic and all of that. They don't have to worry. Everything's okay. And besides, such minor little objects of your devotion cannot possibly harm me. <laughs> No, 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 we're fine, we're fine. Mm. So now let us begin the more rational, normal video about the year 1996. Now, I alluded a little bit about the advertising earlier. And uh, yes, there was a lot of advertising for this event, especially on television. And again, Fox tied in a lot with uh, the Fox network uh, on, on Halloween. I believe they showed the X-Files and other programs that were scary that night. And they tied them in to Halloween Horror Nights by having bumper commercials in between the shows about the event from the event as it did the previous year. Lots of interesting stuff, including scenes filmed inside houses, which are quite nifty. Uh, they made it look like they're going into the Psycho House, which is actually in California. Uh, or, well, I mean, there was no Psycho House at, at Universal. I mean, they had the building, but they didn't have the, uh, the Bates Motel uh, used as a, as, a, as a horror house this year. Um, but... Uh, but um, they did film all of this and, and tied it into the event quite a bit. And a lot of the advertising featured the Frankenstein monster. There was almost a nationwide media blitz for the event before it happened, featuring the Frankenstein monster. And you'd think, well, he'd be featured largely at the event. And he actually did appear in one of the houses. But if you went into the event, you would see that the character who seemed to be preeminent was the Crypt Keeper who had been, of course, the icon the previous year. In fact, this year he had almost higher profile than he had before. Uh, he was not the icon and, and was not, not used in any advertising whatsoever. Very strange. Very strange. Uh, Coke Zero. Product placement, of course, advertising for Halloween Horror Night. See, anyway, going back to uh, where I was. Uh, let's see. Yes. The Crypt Keeper was featured in his own house and also was the Grand Marshal of the parade that debuted that year. So that was kind of uh, strange that in all the print advertising, the billboards and uh, newspaper advertisements and, of course, the brochures featured that strange image I alluded to in my previous video with the glowing eyes in the dark and something clawing through as if breaking through a barrier entering our reality from some dark abyss journey into fear. <clears throat> Anyway, so we had three lovely houses that year, except there were actually four houses because one of the houses, once again, two completely separate houses with two different queue entrances and walkthroughs in one house in the sound stages, and that was Universal's House Horror, now called Universal's New House of Horrors, which featured, of course, classic Universal monsters on one side especially Frankenstein, but also Dracula and the Wolfman and Mummy, etc. And the other side, though, we had something different. Unlike the previous years and later years that they would do this, instead of going into modern-day horror films, they went into real-life horror. They had real-life atrocities and murders from throughout history, such as Jack the Ripper and Lizzie Borden, uh, especially Lizzie Borden. Now, that, those rooms really are clear in my mind as being quite memorable. I only went to, to the event once, although I did manage to get on a day off. Didn't call in sick that year. I went on my day off, but I only went once because I wasn't quite so obsessed with the event as I am nowadays. But uh, still, one, one night was enough so long as I hit all the houses and I, at least once and got to see Bill and Ted, I was satisfied in those days and so I did so but uh, 
So if you remember more than Lizzie and Jack and other things that might have been in that house, you can give me a, a message and let me know what else might have been lurking in the real life Horace. So I can't quite remember too much more about it, but I think it's interesting that those two characters were featured because, of course, connecting, connecting. Lizzie Borden had appeared earlier with the Lizzie Borden uh, uh, band and act score, remember, in the Scare Zone in 94, and then she would appear in a Scare Zone in the year 2008 in American Gothic. And Jack the Ripper would be featured quite strongly that year as well when they retconned his story to feature the body collectors in collections of the past and the Scare Zone Streets of Blood in 2008. So we do have a line of connection through the years continuing, as I have said before, because of fear, who has been there all along in one form or another, perhaps very strongly this year in 1996. Well, mm. The Crypt Keeper had his own house as well, this time the studio tour of terror, not, not visiting his own mansion but rather going through an old decrepit abandoned movie studio where diabolical doings are going on, perhaps snuff films or something, and you go through various sets and, and see blood and gore and horror happening inside this old set of the, of the haunted studio with the Crypt Keeper as your guide. And then there was a third house, which was the, and that house was in the uh, earthquake queue, as it had been, as the Dungeon of Terror had been earth the year before. And another brand new house in Nazamins. It seemed to be the place in these years for, to showcase something new and original. And that house was Toy Hell Nightmare at the Scream Factory, in which uh, you go into an old toy factory where the toy makers had been quite demented and had used actual human body parts in making their toys in the toy factory. <laughs> Not like Santa Claus's elves, these were evil. And then of course the toys themselves came to life and took over the place. So evil toys are presented quite gloriously in a way that connected weirdly to the latest Chucky house last year which also took place in a toy factory possessed by evil. Hmm. So we have all of those wonderful things going on. Now, there was only one scare zone this year, and that's probably because of the debut of the parade. You know, you can't really have too many scare zones where the parade route is, so the scare zone was limited to Amity, where there's an, always been a midway of some sort, and there we had the midway of the bazaar, once again with lots of fog and clowns and strange carnival of madness sort of thing going on. And, you never knew what sort of sideshow freak or clown would come leaping out of the fog to get you. Very fun. But don't think you were safe in the other areas because our good old friends, the Chainsaw Drill Team, were on hand to pop out and rev up their chainsaws to eviscerate, especially young girls who scream so loudly and run frantically from chainsaws. Yes, that was fun. The Chainsaw Drill Team, of course, were the lead-off for the very first Festival of the Dead Parade, which debuted that year. Vroom! And there they go. Exciting. Leading the parade, followed by the floats, beginning with the Crypt Keeper's own float, as he was the Grand Marshal, and then having many other floats featuring skeletons and demons and all sorts of voodoo witchcraft and things that sort of fit in with a Mardi Gras-esque feeling of the parade. Interesting enough, Mardi Gras debuted the same year at Universal, I believe. And so this sort of fit in with having a, a Halloween version during Halloween and beads and candy and trinkets are thrown out by the various people on the float. There were snake goddess and sacrificial victims and voodoo priests and vampires looking very much like vampires from Anne Rice. We had a blonde vampire playing a keyboard, looked just like Lestat and a dark morose vampire off to the side like Louis. So you have that sort of feeling of the, of the whole Mardi Gras, New Orleans thing, fitting into the parade to a bit. And of course, stilt walkers and skeletons and demons. One particular demon must be mentioned. All red and muscular on the stilts with big, huge horns. It was the big horn guy from Legend, as Peter Griffin called him. Don't party with a big horn guy from Legend, you put your eye out. And of course, uh, the Lord of Darkness, as portrayed by Tim Curry in Universal Pictures Legend, directed by Ridley Scott. The Lord of Darkness appeared for the first time at Halloween Horror Nights this year in the parade. And he would appear, of course, 
in later years in all sorts of interesting ways. <clears throat> so the parade was quite wonderfully debuted that year. There were other shows presented that year, of course. Uh, magic, a magic show was brought back now that for the first time in a couple of years that they got rid of uh, Beetlejuice's stupid game show and they put in tricks, treats and trances which featured among other magic tricks a hypnotist who would bring up the volunteer and put them into a trance and make them do silly things with this hypnotic mesmerific power and then of course there was also a show called Welcome to My Nightmare which was sort of a rock and roll impersonator show with different acts different, uh, you know, portraying different famous rock stars like Kiss or Alice Cooper, but it was actually, uh, you know, people playing those parts. It wasn't really original. Um, the reaction wasn't the actual, the actual big name performers and doing that. And then there was, of course, the Bill and Ted show, which was quite nifty that year. I remember that quite clearly. Uh, some of the Bill and Ted's, I got fuzzy in my mind, but this year's was a very good Bill and Ted. It was all themed to the X-Files. Uh, the cigarette-smoking man was the evil villain that year, and he attacked and kidnapped Bill and Ted to get their time machine. And so it was all sorts of government agents who came to the rescue of Bill and Ted. We had, of course, agents Fox Mulder and Dana Scully from X-Files, also Agent Ethan Hunt of the CIA, or whatever, IMF, or whatever it is, Impossible Missions Force, from the, as portrayed by Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible movies. And there were a lot of Tom Cruise jokes at one point. Ethan Hunt wearing his sunglasses and his shirt and his underwear comes out and dances old time rock and roll like Tom Cruise did in Risky Business. So that was the uh, other government officials who stepped in to help was Bond, James Bond from across the sea. He had to help his American cohorts in saving Bill and Ted from the evil Oh, cancer man, and also characters like the Terminator and the Crow, along with uh, Snake Plissken from uh, Escape to L.A., which was in theaters that year, originally Escape to New York, of course, because no one ever saw the sequel, and Will Smith uh, doing a rap in character as, you know, the Fresh Prince shtick in character as the hero of Independence Day showed up at one point. The Cancer Man acquired some villains to combat these heroes, uh, of course. Boba Fett from Star Wars, which was having its CGI uh, special editions coming out around that time. Uh, Catwoman, for some reason. And that caused a lot of silly jokes, especially with James Bond and Catwoman and Pussy Galore and pussies of all sort were alluded to. Cats, of course, the, like Bob, the little fluffy animals, not anything not naughty. Get your mind out of the cellar, naughty, naughty children. And, of course, the evil uh, Terminator from Terminator 2, the one that's dressed like a motorcycle cop and can morph into things, although there wasn't a lot of morphing going on because low-budget special effects for the show. <laughs> so we have uh, all of these and battles going on. And finally, of course, uh, for some reason, Olympic gymnast... Uh, comes in, I think it was Kerry Stroog in those days, broke her leg, and then of course it all ended with Kiss, yes, Kiss singing I Wanna Rock and Roll All Night and Party Every Day to climax the show. Uh, why they didn't play God Gave Rock and Roll to You, I'm not sure, except that was you know, more recent Kiss and this was makeup era Kiss, I guess. I At any rate, that was the Bill and Ted show that year, quite wonderful. So the whole thing was spectacular, bigger than it had ever been, longer than it had ever been. Not three nights now, from the three nights and fright nights, it expanded five times to 15 nights now, extending beyond Halloween night into November. And this time it went from all the way through the, to, to November 1st and 2nd, from beginning in October 11th. So we had 15 nights of Halloween Horror Nights in 1996. It was a truly memorable, delightful year and one of the best. <clears throat> so that's all I have to say. I finished this in one video. That's amazing. So here we are with Halloween Horror Nights 1996. And next time we'll talk about Frightmares in the year 1997. And I hope I won't go mad or have any strange insanity. But you know, fear is lurking. He's always been there behind the scenes. And you never know 
when he may strike again. Until then, I remain yours truly, Dr. Jimmy.